Good. Well, I'm happy to be here once again. <laughs> and today I want to tell you about three, whoops, the only thing I always forget is to get the little hand off of the screen. There we go. Um, about three rather different areas of physics that seem quite distinct. Chaos, black holes, and quantum mechanics. But I'm going to try to convince you that in fact they're deeply connected. And that will be my main goal during this talk. I can't think of a fancier way to start except to go through them one by one. So let's start by talking about chaos, what it is, or, or actually more precisely what it isn't. So let's start by talking about what it isn't. The modern mathematical view of the world probably goes back to Newton's time. Uh, the setup that, that he and his colleagues introduced was to imagine you have objects like the sun and the earth. You specify their position and then you specify their velocity. Let's say the sun is at rest and the earth is moving however fast it's moving. And then once you have those initial conditions, you can use the laws of motion, Newton's laws, to evolve the system forward in time. You can figure out what it does in the future. Well, we all know what it does. The Earth goes around the sun, and it's very regular. Once a year, the Earth comes back to where it started, like clockwork. Okay? It is part of clockwork. Okay? Well, I have to tell you, in this case, the future is easily predictable. This is not typical. This is not the way most systems work. Okay? It's usually hard to predict the future, as many of you know from personal experience. All right, uh, a, a more mundane example is to imagine you're playing pool. You have a cue ball, this white thing, you set up the triangle. I don't know, what are all the balls in the triangle called? The other ones, okay? And you shoot the cue ball at that triangle. You usually don't know where the other balls are going to end up unless you're a very good pool player. And it's hard to be a good pool player. And what underlies this difficulty, the difficulty in being a pool player, is the notion of chaos. In particular, the notion of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This is a technical term that is often synonymous with, with uh, chaotic behavior. So I found some figure from an old physics book. Modern physics books don't talk about pool, but this old one did. This is a picture of how you analyze a collision. Imagine this is one of the pool balls in the triangle, let's say the eight ball. And this is the cue ball, the white ball, you've set up coming in. And you imagine you've set it up on a trajectory a little bit below the center line. Well, you know what happens. The white cue ball comes in, it goes down. The eight ball goes up. So, but now imagine you change the initial condition a little bit. Imagine that the cue ball is like a fraction of an inch above the center line instead of a fraction of an inch below. Then what happens is the cue ball goes way up and the eight ball goes down. A small change in initial conditions makes a big change in the final positions of the balls. Initial conditions get magnified. Small changes in initial setup make big changes in the future. This underlies the difficulty in predicting the future and in playing pool. You have to be very accurate for how you aim the cue ball. Okay. Well, this is the central notion in our idea of chaos. And the, the canonical example to talk about, although it's actually a rather difficult one to understand, is the weather. And in this context, the slogan that's often used is it's the butterfly effect. Maybe one way of thinking about it. Imagine a hurricane starts forming off the coast of Africa where some hurricanes form. And it develops, it gets stronger, it goes across the Atlantic, and it makes landfall on the Florida panhandle, just like recently. Now run the experiment again and imagine that the hurricane forms off the coast of Africa, but there's a butterfly that happens to be flying around that flaps its wings and changes the air currents slightly. Well, so the myth goes, then because of the sensitive dependence on initial condition, the track of the hurricane will change. It starts changing by a little and then more and more, and maybe it makes landfall on the coast of North Carolina. A tiny change in initial condition, the butterfly flaps its wings, makes a big change in the future consequence. Well, you can see that this might make it hard to predict the weather. Okay? You don't know where all the butterflies are in the world. Okay? 
And in fact, this kind of chaos is a fundamental source of uncertainty. Even in classical physics, you've probably heard about the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics and indeterminacy in quantum mechanics. I believe it's the case that almost all of the difficulty in predicting the future that we experience in everyday life has nothing to do with that. What it's got to do with is this kind of chaos that's present in, even in classical physics. Because of its political importance, I need to add a caveat to the story. And the caveat is that sensitive dependence on initial conditions does not mean that nothing is predictable. Does not mean that, okay? Well, not if you live in Santa Barbara, but let's say you live in the East Coast in a real place like Maine or something. <laughs> okay, then it is, I assure you, the case that the summer is hotter than the winter, okay? Every year, okay? There's just more sunlight that shines per unit area on the ground in the summer up in the, um, in the north than in the winter. More energy comes in, it makes things hotter. The winter, it cools off. Okay, that happens. It's got nothing to do with chaos. Predicting exactly in the summer when the next thunderstorm will happen, that's difficult. But this overall forcing pattern is easy to predict. Similarly, and here's the political complexity, dumping large amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere Okay, where the greenhouse effect can trap energy that makes the world heat up. Okay, chaos has nothing to do with it, difficulty in prediction. It's just an energy balance. Okay, you store more energy and things will heat up. Okay, now predicting the detailed size of the effect and the time force, for instance, exactly when the polar ice caps will melt, exactly when sea level will increase by several feet. That is difficult and may involve chaotic phenomena, but the overall trend is easy to predict. It's just hard to do something about. Okay. All right, so that's the caveat. Even though chaos is kind of a, a nuisance because we would like to know what's happening in the world, it actually leads to simplicity. And the kind of situation I have in mind is to imagine what happens in a box of gas. For these purposes, think of the box of gas as just a classical set of billiard balls moving around according to Newton's laws. And imagine you start the billiard ball atoms in a very unusual place. You imagine, forget about gravity for now. Okay, imagine they're stacked up in this vertical line and you give them different velocities, some big, some small, pointing in different directions. What's gonna happen? Well, you can kind of visualize. I, well, I was gonna say I should have made a movie, but that's impossible. So I, I just to do it in your mind. Imagine these things bouncing around in the box. The boxes have hard walls. They scatter, they do the sensitive dependence on initial things, and pretty soon they'll, they'll be crazily spread all over the box. And in fact, the density of atoms, which was very high in the center and low before, will eventually go to a uniform density. Suppose one of these uh, balls was moving with high velocity, so it had a lot of energy. After collisions, it will share that energy uniformly among all the atoms, and each atom will, on average, have the same amount of energy. You'll have a constant energy density. These constant densities of number of atoms, of energy, are hallmarks of what we call thermal behavior, what it means to have a hot system at a certain temperature. And this uniformity, this approaching uniformity, is what we call coming to thermal equilibrium. Of course, the word thermal means that there's temperature involved. And what is temperature? Well, in this kind of system, you just look at a particle and you say, how much kinetic energy does it have on average? And that kinetic energy is equal to the temperature of the system times this funny constant that changes degrees into energy units times three halves because we live in three dimensions. So temperature is just a measure of the average energy of a system. So thermal behavior in systems like this is a consequence of chaos. When you make yourself a cup of tea, you're enjoying the benefits of chaos. Without it, you might heat up one corner of your teacup, the rest would stay cold. But that's not what happens. Okay. Now, you need to often quantitatively figure out how sensitive to initial conditions you are. How strong is this chaos that you have? Well, here's a picture, let's say, of these storm tracks of the hurricanes. Here's, I guess, the hurricane going to the Florida panhandle. Here's the one after the butterfly flaps going to the North Carolina coast. You imagine these two tracks, 
one is the unperturbed track and perturb the second one by a little bit, what happens is these tracks, or the trajectories of particles, diverge exponentially in time. Okay? That means that they double after every amount of time. You might start with these trajectories an inch apart. Hurricanes, well, we should have a bigger unit. But imagine pool balls starting an inch apart. After one second, say, they're two inches apart. After two seconds, they're four inches apart. Three seconds, eight inches apart. That's this doubling pattern. And in case you don't know, this kind of pattern piles up very quickly. After just 10 seconds, these two balls will be 85 feet apart, 1,024 inches. So if these pool balls start on a pool table, after 10 seconds, there, you know, one has left the back door and one has left the front door of the pool hall. Okay? Things diverge very quickly. Mathematically, you write that the distance grows like an exponential, e to some number times time. This number, which tells you how fast things are increasing, is called a Lyapunov exponent. It is the signature, it is the characterization of how strong chaos is. A big Lyapunov exponent means trajectories diverge fast. You have strong chaos. And although weather actually is a very complicated system, it has lots of Lyapunov exponents and other kinds of stuff, roughly speaking, one of the Lyapunov exponents gives a divergence time of about five days. And that's why it's hard to predict a weather forecast for more than five or maybe 10 days. Okay? It's going to be very hard to predict weather 100 days out because tiny, tiny butterfly flaps will cause weather patterns to change almost completely. Okay? So this is the story about uh, our, a, a rough summary of what we mean by chaos. It turns out there's another way to diagnose it that seems a little bit elaborate and, and contrived, but it turns out it will be useful for the next part of the story, the story about black holes. So here's another way to diagnose uh, chaos. Remember we started on a previous slide with having this vertical line of atoms and letting them evolve in time into this rather uh, spread out pattern? Well, suppose you get here and then you Run the movie backwards, the movie you just watched. And the way you do that is you make every velocity and you turn it into the opposite velocity. If things were moving 10 miles an hour to the right, you make them move 10 miles an hour to the left. And when you do that and you run the thing forward, it will just be like running the movie backwards. This rather random set of atoms will, the way you've watched movies run backwards, you know, you break an egg and you're scrambling it and stuff. You run the movie backwards, and the egg unscrambles and goes up into the unbroken eggshell. These very surprising things. And they're surprising because you've delicately adjusted these velocities and positions so that if you run forward, you'll get into this very unlikely state. That's, you can do that. It just, it's very, you know, it takes a very delicate adjustment of the situation here to do that. And then you can ask the question, suppose you set up a delicate situation to make an unlikely thing, to unscramble the eggs. What would happen if you disturb things here a little bit? You move this atom up a little bit or change that velocity by a little bit. If you do a lot, clearly you're going to disturb this delicate unscrambling process. And the question is, how much can you disturb things by? The longer you run the movie backwards, because of the sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the less error you can tolerate here. And so, in fact, you can say the amount of error you can tolerate decreases exponentially the longer this time evolution is. And that's another equivalent way of measuring this Lyapunov exponent. How small an error can you tolerate as a function of the time you evolve? All right, the reason to go through this is because this is a kind of situation we can set up in a black hole, which is the second kind of physics we're going to talk about. Okay, so I have to give you the world's shortest course on black holes. So let's, let's start. All right. Black holes are a striking consequence of our modern theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. As I'm sure you've heard, this is a theory about the geometry of space-time. That's what we think gravity is. And a black hole is a profound distortion of space-time geometry, a big kink in the geometry of space-time. And once you enter a black hole, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, nothing can get back out if you don't think about quantum mechanics. 
And so in particular, light can get, can't get back out. And so in an artist's rendition, if you had a black hole sitting in front of a star field, the star's light would enter the black hole and it would just never get out. It would look like a black disk on the sky. In fact, that's not the way many black holes work. Black holes can eat things, planets, other stars and stuff, and they liberate enormous amounts of energy. So in fact, many of the brightest objects in the sky are black holes. Quasars, I guess the general word is active galactic nuclei. So black holes are enormous engines of light. But if you clear out the area around the black hole so nothing is falling in it, then it would look like this. Okay. Now black holes are hard to visualize because they, they involve this interesting distortion of space and time. Space and time get mixed together. And it's hard to draw pictures about that, of that mixing. And physicists have invented various ways of visualizing this, but they're, they're actually rather abstract and hard to explain. A lot of what you do in a course in general relativity is, is develop ways of understanding those pictures. But so the best I can do is sort of offer some metaphors that, for the way black holes behave, each one of which is rather inaccurate. But, well, there'll, there'll be small lies in the service of a greater truth. Okay. <laughs> So here's the first inaccurate metaphor. Think about the sphere beneath which, if you enter it, you can't get out again. This is called the horizon or an event horizon. Okay, this is like that black disk. So it looks like a sphere. It's got a certain size, a certain radius. Inside the sphere is something called a singularity. If you fall into a black hole, there's this horrible place where you're stretched more and more, and we really don't know what happens at the singularity but we know enough to realize it's not a good place to be, okay? It will tear every known kind of matter apart into shreds. But this picture, one of its first uh, inaccuracies is it looks like it's a point, and if you fall in and you're clever, you could actually avoid the singularity. No, no chance, okay? So this is a second metaphor, okay? You think of kind of a whirlpool, of, of a, a current of water that represents space-time, and then this circle is this event horizon. If you're outside the event horizon and you use a lot of energy, if you have a boat here with a powerful motor, you can eventually escape. But once you're inside the horizon, the whirlpool takes over and you're sucked in inexorably into the bottom of the whirlpool and that's where the singularity is. There's no hope, okay? So, to summarize, once you get inside, you can't get out, no matter how much energy you use, you inevitably hit the singularity. An important point for us in a, in a minute or two is the size of a black hole increases if you throw mass or energy into it. If you drop a little planet into a giant black hole, it eats it and gets a little bigger, okay? Even if you drop like a, a something smaller, it grows a little bit. The size of the horizon is related to how much mass it, it, it absorbs. Lastly, if you are just a, outside the horizon and you plan very carefully and you have enormously powerful, let's say, rockets or outboard motors, by expending enormous amounts of energy, you eventually can escape. As soon as you cross the horizon, you have no chance. It would take an infinite amount of energy. So using these basic ideas, we can set up one of these run-the-movie-backwards situations, and we can look for chaos in the physics of black holes. So this is the way the situation works. Here's one of these special run the movie backwards configurations. This is a piece of the black hole horizon drawn schematically. And let's imagine we have a particle of light called a photon. And we start it just outside the horizon. But we use, give it enormous energy so it can kind of hug the horizon for a long time and finally leave. That's a kind of unusual thing. Most things that start close to the horizon just fall in. So this is a delicately tuned situation. It turns out it requires starting exponentially close to the horizon if this is a long time, because this distance from the horizon increases exponentially in time for a light ray. Okay. It also requires an enormous amount of energy. Particles of light, you know, if you have a blue particle of light, a blue photon, that's kind of higher energy than a red one. So I've drawn them carefully with a blue one, then a green one, then an orange one, then a red one. Its energy is decreasing. We call that 
the energy redshifts away. You decrease energy when you flow toward the red of the spectrum. Okay. Or you can say you blue shift when you come in. Okay, well now let's ask, this is this delicately tuned thing, like running the movie backwards, unscrambling the egg. What happens if you disturb it a little bit? You can imagine, what's a natural perturbation to do? Well, you can imagine dropping something into the black hole, like a tennis ball. What happens when you drop something into a black hole? Here's the tennis ball. That color doesn't mean anything. That's just the color of the tennis ball, okay? okay. Well, we know what happens. The black hole horizon increases a little bit in size. But if this photon was really close to the horizon, this, because you're running a long way, a little tiny increase in the size of the horizon lets the black hole swallow the photon. So this little change, this tennis ball, means that the photon is now inside the horizon. And then it's lost. It's no longer going to comfortably go away. It inevitably will go inside and hit the singularity. So a tiny change makes a big effect in the future of this photon. Okay? And so this is an example of this kind of sensitive dependence of initial conditions in gravity. You set up this delicately tuned situation. The smallest addition to the black hole will dramatically change the course of this. Okay. So black holes, in fact, have chaos built into their dynamics. This actually uh, is, a is a reinterpretation of some results of Herard at Tuff from 20 or 30 years ago. Now, I'm just, I guess this slide just says what I just said. Because this thing engulfs it, this is a dramatically different outcome. Um, and if you're waiting an exponentially long time, this thing is exponentially close to the horizon, so it takes a tiny, tiny mass, an exponentially small mass to do this. These exponential sensitivities are the signal of this Lyapunov behavior. So this is a kind of classical chaos present in classical general relativity. You just use classical equations to determine this. Well, the third topic I was talking about is quantum mechanics. Okay, so what does this have to do with quantum mechanics? Well, here things get actually a little more subtle, all right? And the way the story will go is that there it turns out in the last 25 years or so, a remarkable development has happened in, in theoretical physics, which it turns out that there's a map, it's often called a duality, between things involving classical gravity and quantum dynamics of other systems. And so if you know something about the way classical gravity behaves, you know something about the way those other quantum systems behave. This correspondence is called gauge gravity duality, and the general framework was discovered by Juan Maldacena and has really changed the way a lot of physics is done in, in recent years. It was really a revolutionary development. As I said, it's a precise mapping between an ordinary quantum mechanical system without gravity turns out a good example is like the theory of the strong interactions called QCD and a quantum gravity situation. And there's a dictionary between these two systems. So if you know what happens in one system, you can figure out what's happening in another. And this, this is a little tricky. It was tricky for many of us when we first heard about it. Well, here's a kind of picture of what's going on. Think of this gray sphere as where the ordinary system lives. Inside the sphere, inside the ball, is where gravity lives. So here's gravity that's made a black hole. This inside of the sphere is the same as the edge, the, the surface of the sphere. All right? The ordinary quantum system lives on this boundary. This is some quantum many-body system with various degrees of freedom. And quantum gravity lives inside the shell. We know that quantum black holes are thermal. Hawking taught us that if you add quantum mechanics to black holes, they no longer stay black. They radiate thermal radiation. So that means the boundary system is, is a thermal one, too. Thermal systems exhibit chaos. Where's the chaos in the boundary system? It's this classical black hole chaos that I just described. It turns out when the boundary system has many degrees of freedom, the gravitational system, the black hole, behaves classically. That's part of the dictionary. While the boundary system remains strongly quantum mechanical. 
so classical gravity can give results via this dictionary to certain quantum systems with many degrees of freedom. So this classical Lyapunov behavior of black holes we just discussed translates into quantum Lyapunov behavior of this boundary system. We've calculated the quantum butterfly effect in this system. This is something uh, that uh, Douglas Stanford and I did and independently Kitaev did of order five years ago. We actually can calculate this number, this Lyapunov exponent. It involves the temperature of the system, this funny constant, and it involves h-bar, the amount of quantum mechanics in a system. And the smaller the amount of quantum mechanics, the bigger the Lyapunov exponent. And the hard part of the calculation, as is often the case, is to figure out this 2 pi in front. Okay? <laughs> That's where all the work in science is, is figuring out 2 pi and factors of 2. Okay? The rest of this you could guess pretty quickly. All right, this calculation has taught us some lessons about quantum chaos in these boundary systems, these systems with lots of degrees of freedom that are highly quantum mechanical. One example is it motivated the derivation of what we call the chaos bound, something that Juan Maldacena, Douglas Stanford, and myself worked out. It says the quantum Lyapunov exponent of any quantum system. You define sort of this divergence of trajectories in a way appropriate to quantum mechanics. It's bounded by the black hole value. The Lyapunov exponent in any system is less to this number you calculated for a black hole. Now, whenever you make a precise statement, and this was a precise statement, there's fine print. This is the fine print, okay? For those of you that can't read it, this just says with reasonable physical assumptions. <laughs> the fine print doesn't invalidate the result, okay? It, it's, it's real, but there needs to be some qualifications. Sakino and Lenny Susskind were thinking about this exponential rate of growth, and they made the bull conjecture that this exponential rate of growth was the fastest any system could behave. And they made a conjecture, called, and they stated it as black holes are the fastest scramblers in nature. Scrambling just means a kind of chaos. What we've established here is a quantitative version of this result. No system in, in nature can become chaotic faster than a black hole. So black holes, in addition to the blackest things around, they're also the most chaotic things around. Okay. Well, these results are satisfying. They taught us some new things about, mostly about ordinary systems via this duality. But the gravitational physics involved, this experiment about dropping things in and the horizon increasing, this stuff is not new. This is stuff that could have been figured out many, many years ago, and in fact was. And so the question is, can we extend beyond the limit where gravity is classical and use quantum chaos to learn new things about quantum gravity? I, I like quantum gravity, and so my interest is uh, going the other way. Okay. We were happy to figure this stuff out, but it, it wasn't what really I cared about. So the second part of the talk, I want to tell you that we think the answer is yes. Okay. And that involves learning something else about quantum mechanics. And that something else is the essence of quantum systems. A defining feature of quantum systems whose motion is bounded, let's say like the Earth going around the sun when the Earth doesn't escape, or a hydrogen atom where you have an electron going around a proton, and it just stays near the proton. Energies cannot assume arbitrary values. You know, we think that the Earth could have practically energy any, any energy you wanted, and that's almost true. In fact, the energies are discrete that are allowed by the rules of quantum mechanics. We say that the energy is quantized. Quantized, that's the same root as the word quantum. Okay. So this means the energies are discrete, and these discrete energy levels each correspond to a different quantum state of the system. For instance, here is a list, a picture of what the allowed energies in a hydrogen atom look like. There's this one, they have fancy labels, and this one. You can't have a hydrogen atom with an energy there. It is against the rules of quantum mechanics. And you can see they have a rather regular pattern. They sort of bunch up here. Above here, the electron would become unbound and fly off to infinity. It would be ionized in, in the jargon. Okay. But there is this regular pattern of discrete levels that is the hallmark of quantum mechanics. 
Suppose you take a chaotic system that's quantum. Its energy levels are discrete. Let's say a, a, a cue ball moving around a pool table with some bumpers to make it move chaotically. It will have discrete levels. They'll look rather different than that, those levels in a hydrogen atom. They'll be much less regular. But they still follow a characteristic pattern. And this is a figure taken from one of the first papers in the subject. So uh, I'm not too disappointed that it's not too high a quality graphic. Here's some fake data, okay, of what a system that's not chaotic would look like. Each of those lines is an energy. And I want to point out some characteristic features of this uh, set of energy levels. Sometimes they get quite close. In fact, these little carrots on the side, those indicate two energy levels that are closer than, let's say, I think it's a quarter the average spacing. So each of those carrots reflect two closely spaced energy levels. And you can see there's a lot of carrots in this list. I think about 12. There are 50 energy levels here. Further, you see some big spaces. Sometimes energy levels are far apart. And in fact, these energies basically don't care where the other ones are. These are chaotic systems. This is a, the energy levels actually from a complicated nucleus. These are the energy levels of a cue ball on a, on a pool table made quantum mechanical. And these are the energy levels actually in a beautiful mathematical system that actually tends to behave this way. It involves the Riemann zeta function, for those of you that like beautiful mathematics. And you can see the pattern of energy levels here is quite different. There are only two carrots here, three here and none here. There are many fewer white spaces. The energy levels, first of all, they don't like to be right next to each other. In this kind, which is a little bit more chaotic, they really don't like to be next to each other. We say the energy levels repel. There's short-range level repulsion in the jargon. Further, if you think about these energy levels as kind of particles in another sort of gas, it's sometimes called the Dyson gas, here it looks like the gas can have sound waves, of origin, regions of low density, regions of high density. Here it looks much more like a crystal. The system is more rigid. This list of energy levels is often called a spectrum. And you say you have long-range spectral rigidity. These are two characteristics of the energy levels in quantum chaotic systems. And where we're going with this, what we think is the case, is that black holes, which are quantum systems and they're chaotic, must have energy levels like this. And we're trying to figure out what that means for quantum gravity. Well, so chaos gives rise to simplicity in the energy level pattern. I give kind of a qualitative picture. But in fact, it's much deeper than that. There's a precise mathematical pattern these energy levels have. There's a remarkable conjecture that quantum chaotic energy levels obey something called random matrix statistics. I'll tell you what that means, so don't be too puzzled. This goes back to Eugene Wigner, a famous physicist in the 1950s. And what's interesting about this is a universal pattern. It's a regularity that's there in quantized billiards, in a, a hot gas of atoms, in a burning piece of coal, in a piece of uh, quantum chronodynamics that's hot. Any system that looks thermal will have this pattern of energy levels. These kinds of universal phenomena are very important in physics because they seem to reflect deep, underlying kind of principles with wide applicability. And this is an example of one. And to be frank, for the, until a couple of years ago when I started learning about this, I had no idea how universal this is. It's really striking. Okay. What is a random matrix statistics? Well, I have to teach you, all right, here's a world's shortest course on quantum mechanics. Okay. <laughs> it turns out the dynamical rules of quantum mechanics determine a matrix. A matrix is an array of numbers. Here's a square array, four by four matrix. The rules, let's say that electron and proton interact elect uh, electromagnetically with a Coulomb force, tells you what numbers to put in these entries. It's usually quite complicated. It's hard to figure out, and these matrices are big. Once you have a matrix, there's a mathematical thing you can do to it. It's called diagonalizing it. You learn this, I guess, the first year in college if you take a course in matrices. 
and when you diagonalize it, you find something called its eigenvalues. If you have a four by four matrix, you get four numbers called its eigenvalues. The payoff is those eigenvalues are the energy levels of the system. And in fact, the first formulation of quantum mechanics due to Heisenberg was of this form, and it was called matrix mechanics. Okay. <coughs> So setting up this Hamiltonian is quite difficult. You've got to know a lot about the laws. If you had a, a gas of a billion atoms or more, you'd have to know, where, you know what they, how their interactions are. It would take a lot of work to write down this matrix. The remarkable thing is if you have a chaotic system, you can just throw all that out, and you write down a matrix whose entries are random. Literally, you can go entry by entry and flip a coin. If the coins are heads, you put a plus one, if the coin is tails, you put a minus one. You just make a random array of numbers, and then you diagonalize it and find its eigenvalues. That will look like the energy eigenvalues of a chaotic system. What could, well, this is a big improvement, okay? Because you don't have to do all this hard work. It's even better, and it's another uh, consequence of, of chaos leading to simplicity, that it's easy to compute the properties of eigenvalues of a random matrix. You don't have to do this big diagonalization procedure. You can quickly figure out how they behave. Well, this is a really terrible graphic that I stole from the internet. But um, ignore everything on this graphic except these four strips of energy levels. This is fake data about a system that's not chaotic. These three stripes are three broad classes of random matrices. So they made random matrices, they used these clever tricks and figured out what the energy level pattern was. Look at this one, this is the, the, the clearest one. In this one, you can see, here you again, you see these big patches of white, meaning energy levels have no trouble being far apart, and these dark lines, meaning that energy levels almost coincide. So again, you have no repulsion and you have no rigidity. Here you see there's almost no places where energy levels are close and none where they're far apart. You have short range level repulsion. You can't get these levels close together. And you have this long range spectral rigidity. This thing looks like a rather regular crystalline array. Okay. These are just like the pictures of the physical systems that are chaotic. Okay. Black holes in quantum gravity are bound quantum systems. They should have quantized energy levels, and they should be random matrix patterns, okay? That's where we're going. First, we ask to ask how many such levels are there in a black hole? Well, in a thermal system, like a quantum black hole, there's a name for the number of energy levels in a band, say a band whose width is given by the temperature converted to energy units. The logarithm of the number of energy levels is called the entropy. I'm sure that's a word you've all heard. But that's what it is. You take the number of energy levels in a region, like that strip, and you take its logarithm. Okay. But there's a beautiful picture for what the entropy of a black hole is, due to Bekenstein and Hawking. The entropy of a black hole, BH is black hole, or Bekenstein Hawking, or both. Okay. <laughs> You take the horizon, that's the sphere, and you take a length that is characteristic of quantum gravity called the Planck length, okay? It's a very short length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. That's, you know, one divided by a number with, with 30, one with 33 zeros, much less than a centimeter. <laughs> you take this sphere and you divide it into little cells that big on a side. Here they're triangles. And in each triangle, you have one bit of entropy. Entropy is a measure of information, so it's often measured in bits. Okay? Except this is a quantum system, so we often call these bits of information qubits, quantum bits. Okay. For a solar mass black hole, that is, if you take the sun and you wait for it to finish burning its nuclear fuel, and then you give it some help so it'll collapse into a black hole, its radius will go from a big radius now to just three kilometers. Okay, black holes are very dense. They're the densest objects in the world in addition to being the most chaotic. The entropy is you divide that three kilometer diameter sphere 
into these little, little tiny cells, you have 10 to the 78th qubits. That is a big number, okay? It's one followed by 78 zeros. Okay? If you're bored, which I'm sure none of you are bored, but if you were bored, you could write out that number in about a minute, one zero per second, roughly. Okay? But that's not the number of energy levels. That's a logarithm of the number of energy levels. To get the number of energy levels, you have to exponentiate it. It doesn't matter what the base of the logarithm is. Let's take it's 10. So you have to take 10 to the 10 to the 78th energy levels. That is a really large number. Okay. So that's one followed by 10 to the 78th zeros. If you were bored and tried writing that starting at the beginning of the universe, you would, and you wrote one zero a second, you wouldn't have come close to writing that number out. So these black holes are quantum objects, but they have these huge lists of energy levels. Nonetheless, we believe that the energy levels should look like the eigenvalues of a very large, this large, random matrix. Now, in the limit of classical gravity, that Planck length goes to zero, and in fact, you have an infinitely large number of energy levels. That means ener the energy spectrum goes back to being continuous. You can have whatever energy you want. That's how you recover classical physics. But this discreteness of the energy levels and the random matrix behavior are distinctly quantum gravitational phenomena. And that's what we want to look at and try to understand. Well, these ideas are interesting, but they've been extremely difficult to study until recently. The Hamiltonian matrix of a black hole, well, we sort of know what it is because we can use this wonderful gauge gravity duality to say it's the same Hamiltonian matrix as this boundary system. But that's a really complicated system. I assure you, it's really complicated. None of us have even thought about it figuring out its energy levels, okay? The matrices are very large, as I just convinced you. But what's changed this and has allowed us to make some progress is in the last, I guess, three years, a very simple model of a quantum black hole has been introduced that's enabled us to make progress in understanding these questions. And this program I'm part of, one of the major focus points is to understand this model better. And this model in its current form was introduced by Alexei Kitaev and is a variant of a model introduced by Super Sachdev and his student Jim Ye more than 20 years ago. Well, let me just give you a flavor for what this model looks like. This horizon was divided into these bits, which I told you were quantum mechanical pieces of information called qubits. And they store not classical information, but quantum information. So make a model of pure quantum information. Forget about this horizon being a sphere. Forget about the fact that things fall into black holes. Just take a set of qubits and hook them together. In fact, hook them together with interactions in groups of four, say. This qubit interacts with that one, that one, that one, and so on. And to take advantage of this principle we've been using, hook them together with random couplings. Turns out that makes life easier. That's the sachdev ye kitaev model, the SYK model. This model has a lot of good stuff going for it. Well, actually, no, I have something else to tell you. What kind of qubits are you using? Okay. Well, as you probably know, there was an article in the New York Times yesterday about it. There's a spirited competition going on to determine the most practical kind of qubit, because if you have quantum bits, you can do quantum computation. And that's a very important thing. And it's become commercially and actually militarily important. And so companies and governments are spending lots of money on this. And whenever there's lots of money, there's com competition for who succeeds. As you might know, you probably know, Santa Barbara is a hotbed of that, of this. In fact, UCSB is a hotbed of this competition. John Martinez's group at UCSB has forged an alliance with Google to make a, an enormous effort to develop one technology called superconducting circuit qubits. And many people, this New York Times article touted it as the most likely one to succeed in the near term. There's another strategy pursued, I guess it's just is that way, just across the road, at a place called Station Q, which is underwritten by Microsoft. And there's an alliance between Microsoft and UCSB. The idea that they're pursuing is, is something call, involving something called Majorana fermions that are another kind of qubit. It's really half a qubit, but it's okay. okay. The SYK model uses Majorana fermions, which are theoretically a little fancier, but they're easier to work with. 
It's not a surprise because Alexei Kitaev is one of the world's great experts on the physics of Majorana fermions. Okay, so you have this array of Majorana fermion qubits, and now I'll come and tell you all the good properties that that system has. It turns out you can analytically show that this SYK model is maximally chaotic. That means it saturates the chaos bound. Its chaos is just like the chaos of a black hole. You can also think of it as a boundary theory in one of these gauge gravity dualities, and it has a sector of its bulk theory that looks like gravity in one space and one time dimension. That's a very simple gravity, but it's enough to get an idea about how gravity is working in the system. Full disclosure, that's, there's a sector that acts like gravity, but there's another sector that, as far as we can tell, is garbage, and we don't know what it does. Okay, so that, that's part of the discussions we have here. But, but, well, you didn't hear that from me. But, okay, but so we can ignore it. There are regimes when we can ignore it in principle. The last thing is you can compute with it. If you have n Majorana fermions, the number of energy levels is 2 to the n over 2. That one half is because a Majorana fermion is half a qubit. So if you take n equals 34, just as an example, that's about 128,000 energy levels. That's large enough to be interesting. You can sort of see the pattern in that many energy levels. But it's small enough to study on modern classical computers. Okay? So you can actually do numerical experiments on baby models of quantum gravity. And this is a very powerful thing for us. Okay. So here we did it. Here's a picture of that SYK model. This is a list of energy levels. Take that 128,000 levels. This is 50 of them from sort of the middle of the spectrum. Here's what they look like. I think this, these lines are kind of thin, but at least you can get a, a rough idea. You can't see a lot of white space here. And these lines almost never nearly coincide. Otherwise, you'd see dark black lines and lots of white space. These are just the right characteristic to be represented by a random matrix. Well, you can't just look at pictures in this game. You have to have more quantitative tests and say, is this really acting like a random matrix, this baby black hole? OK, so we formulated a more quantitative test. There's a quantity you can find called the spectral form factor. For those of you with a technical background, you take the Fourier transform of the energy differences of the system. For those of you that don't know, don't worry about it. It's just something you can do, and you get a graph. So to te test it out, we did this. We took random matrices. We just flipped coins, generated some matrices, diagonalized them, and computed this diagnostic. And this is the picture that comes out. This beginning part is interesting, but not for us today. What I want you to focus attention on is this part we called a ramp, this vertical line, this sort of diagonal line going up, and then this plateau. This ramp is a signature of long-range spectral rigidity. This plateau is a signature of short-range energy level repulsion. And the detailed shape of this is predicted by random matrix theory. So then we can go and do something quantitative. There's the random matrix results. A large group of us, some of whose names you'll recognize, Joe Polchinski is known to everybody in this room. Phil Saad was an undergraduate here, is now a graduate student with me at Stanford. Alex Stryker is a graduate student here at UCSB. It's a big collaboration because whoops, because it's a little bit like an experiment. It takes a long, it takes, took about a thousand hours of computer time to generate this data. And what you see is you see a ramp and a plateau, just like this ramp and plateau. And when you study the numbers carefully, you see quantitative agreement here. So this is real evidence that this toy black hole, its energy levels act like those of a random matrix. It then becomes a reasonable conjecture that this is true for more general black holes. And that leads us to think it must have an explanation in the quantum theory of gravity. So again, the SYK model, which is a theory of one plus one dimensional gravity, is a nice testing ground for these ideas. And we've worked very hard on this, and it's taken us much longer than we thought. But just in the last year, we think we have some answers to that question. In quantum gravity, as opposed to classical gravity, you have to worry about the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle says, let's say for the quantum mechanics of a particle, its position is never certain. 
you have to account for the fact that the particle can be many places at once. The analog of position in gravity is space-time geometry. The uncertainty principle says you can't just have one space-time geometry. You have many space-time geometries, and you have to include the contributions of lots of them. We found that there was another geometry besides the ordinary geometry of black holes that needs to be included. And it looks like this. We call it the double cone. You can read, this is it unfolded. Think about the line along here as a one-dimensional spatial universe revolving in time. Okay. This geometry explains the ramp. It explains long-range spectral rigidity. And this picture, we can think of generalizations that apply to more general black holes. So this seems to us to be a satisfying explanation of this universal phenomenon that the ramp exists in quantum gravity. And it's because there's quantum fluctuations in the geometry. You have to include more than one. All right, but now we come to the plateau. The plateau, in some sense, is the smoking gun for quantized energy levels. It's what tells you that energy levels are really discrete. They don't overlap. And we work really hard on this. That picture that I showed you, by the way, this appeared in a paper we published like in June. So this is really coming up to the present day. And here, we know that the plateau is a much more subtle phenomenon than the ramp. And we're still not finished figuring out. But we have some ideas, which I, I think are probably right. And because I'm among friends here, I'll speculate. Okay. <laughs> Notice the bold blue here. This is work in progress. Okay. This and the previous work is work of Phil Saad, this former undergraduate here. Douglas Stanford, who is a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, and will join us at Stanford as a faculty member in the spring. What we think is happening is that you need something beyond geometry, even quantum geometry, to explain the plateau. And what you need is the analog of a remarkable object that Joe Polchinski introduced in the study of string theory, a thing he called a D-brain. And what it is, it's, it's not geometry, it's a place where geometry can end. And the picture we think explains the plateau, and here I'm just giving you a taste, is some kind of plane, the D-brain, and then pieces of geometry. Here are these half spheres. You can think of as a little one-dimensional universe starting, getting bigger, and then collapsing again. Lots of them ending on this D-brain. And this will explain the plateau. You don't just have one universe, you have many universes. This is a theory, we've gone from studying the behavior of hurricanes to the studying the theory of many universes ending on a D-brain. Well, we'll keep you posted in that, in that, on the progress of this. I should say that Joe was working with this for a while until he became ill, and I think he would have been pleased to see his great idea coming up in this novel context. But pleased or not, I'm quite sure we would have realized this a lot more quickly if he were still working with us. So, so we miss him very much for lots of reasons. Well, that's the end of the physics story I want to tell you, but I want to take a few minutes to talk about something else. I want to talk about where we are tonight, which is at KITP. As you can see from this talk, many different parts of physics are sort of swirled together. And this often happens. It often happens that ideas you thought of as separate are joined, and that joining often leads to rapid progress. Roughly, if you know if some other area is connected with yours, you can take advantage of all the hard work other people did very quickly. So it's a powerful route to progress. But there are powerful opposing forces to that kind of joining of different fields. And, well, they go back, I think, to the idea that human beings are tribal creatures. Okay, we've seen this to our regret in the in current political scene. Okay. This means that people like me that work on quantum gravity and string theory, we like to talk to other people that are working on quantum gravity and string theory. We share a language. We share common goals. We think the same problems are important. And more prosaically, we often sit in the same part of physics buildings. People that work on uh, classical mechanics, which is still a subject thinking about chaos. Similarly, they like to talk to each other. They declare the same problems are important. They might sit in another building. Okay. The theory of random matrices is highly developed in math departments. 
They're in a different department. Universities are these medieval institutions that sort of codify this sort of tribal feature of intellectual exposition. Okay? It's not that we dislike the, uh, each other, but it, we'd rather, we're just naturally led to people we're familiar with. Well, I have to tell you that this place is, I believe, the most powerful force in the world in theoretical physics opposing that tribal tendency. This place, since it was founded, okay, has deliberately pursued a strategy of bringing together people interested in different things. Okay. You organize programs on rather different subjects you might think have an overlap and have them happen at the same time. You have talks of one group to the other, and more prosaically, but probably even more important, office mates are chosen from different programs. You have to sit next to these people. Okay? <laughs> And now with the Munger physics residents, you have to live next to these people. Okay? And this is a very powerful force, and it has dissolved lots of boundaries. Some of this work started here, and it wouldn't have started without this kind of fluidity that this place enforces. So the final thing I want to say, I understand that this lecture series is underwritten by the Friends of KITP, and you provide lots of other support and encouragement to this place. So myself, as you know, I've first came here almost 40 years ago, okay, when I was a postdoc, that's a little hard to imagine, and I come back every chance I get. That list that Lars showed you is not a lie. Okay. So I want to thank you on behalf of myself and on behalf of the other people in our field for the support you've given this place. It's very important for the development of physics. I'll stop. Questions? Yep. Uh, why do you want to know the energy levels of a black hole, especially when there's so, so, so many of them and they're so close together? That, that's a what, very good what do you, question. What do you get out of that? If you know the energy levels are discrete, that tells you that a black hole acts like an ordinary quantum mechanical object. It obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. And that means, for instance, it doesn't do strange things like swallow up information and not give it back. So what we learn by being able to place the black hole in the, in the family of ordinary quantum systems is that it will act like an ordinary quantum system. And it will preserve information and it will interact with the rest of the world in a reasonable way. And that's not been obvious. And this is part of the program of addressing what's called the black hole information paradox. And so the, the existence of these discrete levels is an important part of the solution of that story. Yeah, I think uh, Hawking's last paper was just recently published. Is there any relationship between that? I don't know its content in any of this work. It is trying to address a similar question. It doesn't speak to this issue of discrete levels and um, random matrix statistics, part of what they try to do in that paper is give a formula for how many energy levels. They try to derive that formula of Bekenstein and Hawking in another way <clears throat> that might illustrate its quantum mechanical origin. So they're driving at similar questions, but from a rather different set of, of tools. One advantage of what they're doing is they're working with black holes in flat space. I didn't tell you the black holes we're dealing with are funny black holes in a funny kind of space that's curved. It makes them easier to address theoretically, but they're a little further away than the black holes in the world. On the other hand, it makes a lot of headaches for them, and they're trying to overcome them. You know, there's this uh, thing that's bothered me for some time. <laughs> if you have an astronaut going toward a black hole, yeah. he will enter it. Yeah. But if you, and relatively, if you're on Earth watching this, he approaches the speed of light as he approaches the event horizon. He His stays there goes forever. To infinity, and time goes to zero. Right. So he's spread, he's smashed on the event horizon. Yeah. So how can the black hole, with regard to the rest of the universe, gain any mass? I mean, it's plastered on the surface, which I guess is the same thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of like that. 
that's actually right. You sort of see it gaining mass that way. Yeah, it's, we, never we never see it go in, but we will see the, the, the edge of the black hole get a little bigger because of the stuff accreting onto it. But you're quite right. They're, they're, they're puzzling things, <laughs> and, but, and that is one of the puzzles. Yeah. With uh, the the, leg, the LIGO uh, the echo mm -hmm. of the uh, consolidation of black holes, is there any information derived from the signal that be, would be relevant to, to the conjecture th uh, that the black hole is a quantum system? Not so much that, but there is a, a very important um, reflection of the fact that black holes are chaotic systems. As you know, the I guess the experiment, well, there's several now, but one involves two black holes meeting each other, whirling around each other, and finally merging, okay? Well, it took them a while, it takes the black holes a while to settle down, I don't know, 60 seconds, but in the settling down process, they ring and they vibrate, but eventually they settle down to the smooth curve. This is very much like if you stir your cup of tea, eventually that stirring motion settles down and the tea stays quiet. It's Thermal damping, and thermal damping is a signature of chaos. It's not the Lyapunov exponent, it's another signature it's related to viscosity. So that damping, the fact that if you remember that signal that vibrated a lot and then sort of settled down, that can be interpreted. In fact, it was Gary Horowitz and his student Veronica Hubini that really pointed this out. That settling down is a kind of thermal damping. It's a, it's a relation, relative of the thermalization that I'm talking about. Can you explain what you think, how black holes will end then? Do they have an ending? And is the information, the, the Hawking radiation he discussed, somehow emitted at the end? Or, or That's what we believe. Exactly when it gets emitted is, is a subject under debate. But if it's an ordinary quantum mechanical system, and, and here this depends on whether you have a black hole in flat space like us, or some of these toy black holes that I didn't elaborate on but are really in curved space, if you have a black hole in flat space, like in the center of our galaxy, we believe that they will slowly radiate because of Hawking radiation, and eventually the black hole will go away after a very long time. And we think if black holes are ordinary quantum mechanical systems, it will just be like uh, uh, an electron-positron atom. Eventually they annihilate and they emit photons and the thing goes away. It's just a very, very complicated atom. The information will come back out. Okay, exactly how and when is puzzling, but that's what most of us believe. Okay. Yes? Does it make sense to talk about an information capacity of space itself? Well, I, I mean, in a sense, suppose you tried to pack more and more disk drives together. Disk drives are old, but some, some way of storing information, iPhones together, and you try to increase the amount of information you store, let's say, in this room. Eventually, you would get such a high density of mass, because information, physical information has to be stored in mass, that the system would collapse into a black hole. And so the information capacity of this room is limited by the size of the black hole you can put in this room. And then you count the qubits on the black hole's horizon. So in some sense, that's the limiting information carrying capacity of space. It's the size of black holes you can put into the space. I'd like to ask the question somewhat differently. Sure. So uh, coherence to decoherence. Okay. So what you're sort of saying, I think, is that you're losing its quantum mechanical properties by decohering, becoming more classical. Can you sort of talk a little bit about that? It, in some deep sense, 
we think that black holes do not decohere. We think that they just obey the rules of quantum mechanics straight on. Okay? Now, a, a system that can effectively decohere, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, I decohere from you. We're not in a delicate quantum superposition. But that's because there's all this radiation around and we're heavy and there's all kinds of other stuff. So effectively, a black hole could decohere from something else. But if we were in an isolated room, you and I would obey the rules of quantum mechanics and we could superpose and be quantum mechanically coherent. Okay? That's what we think black holes are. We think black holes are on the nose. The only wrinkle in that might be the fact that the universe is expanding and there might be multiple universes. But if you forget about cosmology, <laughs> then I think what I say is, is what many, most people believe. On that note, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we, all, as always, do have refreshments back in, uh, in the commons room and courtyard for those of you who just can't get enough. And otherwise, uh, see you at the next event.